All right, here we go. And we are now recording. All right, welcome everybody. I've got a uh, a special old friend of mine named Alan Odinson of Odinson Archery. How you doing, Alan? Thanks for joining us, man. I appreciate it. Doing great, Brian. It's great to talk to you again. You know, Sarah, we, uh, how many years ago has it been since you and I did, uh, we did a recording? I think it was uh, before Trump was elected, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it was actually. It was, um, I, I believe it was, man, man God, time flies. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't, man, it may have been a, a year and a half, two years. I, maybe longer than that. I, I get my time mixed up all the time. My wife's yeah. always telling me that I'm, you know, I'm like, oh, that happened a week ago. And she's like, mm, no, more like two months ago. Huh. I don't pay attention to it either. <laughs> um, that's the social construct I like to ignore. There <laughs> we go. I uh, I remember distinctly, and I've used it a couple times. We were talking, and it came up, and I and the thought really hit me: How long do we have to get our shit together? You know. And then uh, when Trump got elected, it seemed like we've been lulled into this kind of false sense of security. The the uh, the bully pulpit is kind of quiet now. I don't see the same kind of revelry we used to see when we were all looking like the end of the world. I wonder. You think that infrastructure is still there if it's necessary? I mean, I see Brian James doing good stuff with the American Guard and Joshua Long, and but I don't see that same kind of fervor. And I, I and people want to say it's censorship, but I also think we're kind of comfortable, don't you? Absolutely, uh, comfort is one of the biggest dangers that that uh, people in general. I won't even I won't even go so far as to say uh, the right wing. I would say that that uh, people in general. Uh, comfort is the biggest danger that they have, uh, whether it's in life, whether it's you know business endeavors, their own physical fitness, all of these things. It's very, very easy to get comfortable, and uh, it's one of the things I always used to warn people about. I said, you know, when uh, and when Trump gets elected, you know, everyone's going to stand down. They're going to jump around and say, "We won, we did it, it's over," and they're going <laughs> to throw out the deep state and all this stuff. And I'm like, man, you know, a lot of people don't know me from a long time ago but you know i i grew up in you know the early in those early 90 eras when the when the militia movement was really big you know my yeah. my some of my family was involved in that and i'm telling mm -hmm. them i say guys you're not talking about anything new this is the same stuff we were talking about then and look where it's went so you know i i'm not as much of a of eternal optimist as a lot of people are where they're like you know well the you know we're gonna rise up and we're gonna do this and i'm like mm. You know, I, I, I don't really know because <laughs> we're a lot more comfortable now in, in our lives than we ever have been. I mean, how many people are truly willing to do what would need to be done anyway? I mean, we've got all these creature comforts. I mean, you know, people talk of revolution. Are, are you prepared? And this is the question I always ask them. When you talk about revolution, you talk about this, you talk about that. Are you prepared to become the villain? Because if you lose, that's precisely what you will be. It, it, the, the, the glory's only for the winner. That's it. You know, that's absolutely right. I think, I think one of the biggest problems is, and you see, the, you see it when you get to the more radical elements of any kind of movement, is that the ideas that they want to promote are so heavily front-loaded with a, a course of education that, that you've got to take to be accepted by them, or they really get it, or they know what's going on. And, and I've I've kind of, I've been looking at it a lot lately it, and I, I heard a liberal author, she wrote something that really kind of stuck with me. She's like, you know, that's the shallowest kind of association. There's nothing to build on from that. You know, and as soon as there gets a, a fray around the edge, you don't, uh, there's nothing else to do. I mean, you've lost that, that, that's separated. It's burned up, it's gone. And now all of a sudden somebody's, over here doing something and somebody's over there doing something and the movement's been fractured. Then it fractures yet again because everybody's trying to associate on just one issue. I don't think we are aware of even really what we want. You know, most of the time I see people just want to do one thing. Oh, it's abortion. Oh, it's, it's gun control. Oh, it's, I think it's all smoke and mirrors to tell you the truth. Yeah, and, and I would agree. I, I think that, you know, we live in, a, in an outrage culture, you know, it's, it's, it's always, and, and 
everybody points at the left. They go, you know, oh, the, the left wing, they're always snowflakes, and they get upset about this, and they get upset about that. Well, the, the right wing's the same way. Uh, you yeah. know, this week we're fussing about the, you know, the whole thing with the, the climate change girl. I didn't even know who she was <laughs> until people, I saw memes all over the place. And, you know, and people are posting this, and, and it's one of the things that I tell them too, and, you know, other guys have touched on this uh, that you've had on in the past. And uh, people I've even talked to, and uh, you know, people will post these memes and post this person's face over and over and over and over, and and they're making fun of them, and somehow they think, oh, we're getting them, you know, we're making fun of them, and this is going to wake people up and all this. And I say, what you don't understand is you're advertising. You are the best advertisement they have ever had. You're better than a billboard, <laughs> and you're just plastering their face every single. I wish somebody would do that to me. Dude, I, mean, I count on it. I'm telling you right now, I have counted on that because I ain't got no budget for marketing. I promise. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a I'm a gra I'm a grassroots marketeer. I mean, you know, I, I depend on the people. You know, and and that that's what they don't understand is is they're just pushing these people right into the spotlight, and everybody sees them, and uh, you're just making them famous. You know, the first rule of uh, advertising. You know, if if they're not, uh, I won't even say advertising. Uh, a lot of people don't know. I used to do. Uh, I used to do professional wrestling, and the worst thing you could ever do as a worker was to walk out there and have people not make a sound. I wanted them to either be booing me or cheer me, one right. way or another. I wanted them talking about me because if they're talking about me, that means I'm going to put asses in the seat, and that means they're going to put me at the headline. That's it. That's exactly right. I didn't know you were a professional wrestler. Oh, I yeah. know one up in Kansas, and he came to the farm one time. He was cool. He was a pretty cool dude. I mean, what else am I going to do with this ugly mug other than <laughs> build those, right? Right. <laughs> so, but that wrestling, you did it. You competed last week in a sumo tournament, right? Well, that ended up being uh, quite quite the cluster. Uh, I'll, I'll give I'll give kind of the cliff note version of that. So. Um, as the event was set, I've been, and people don't, if they haven't been following me, I've been training for this event since um, late May, I would say. Yeah, you've been doing it for a minute. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was just a whim. It was something that I wanted to do. I've done about every other kind of wrestling. And I said, eh, sumo wrestling looks like fun. Let's try that. So, um, you know, I started training for that. And one of the problems I had with the event promoters was that they were slowly changing rules. You know, it's, it's, and, and I'm, I'm from competition world, man. And, you know, certain things are, are what you do. You know, you make weight, you uh, have a set start time, you have a set set of rules, you don't change stuff up. Right. And as the event was approaching, they were changing things up. And, uh, you know, most of those things affected me and I'm willing to sacrifice for myself. That's, that's not a problem. You know, it's just me. Uh, three days before the competition, they changed yet another rule of uh, saying that spectators couldn't come in. So the issue I had was, you know, I'm going down there with my wife and family and, um, you know, what do you want me to do? Make them sit outside the event, the event for three hours because what ended up happening was they didn't close the brackets off. So they just let people pile up. Well, they only have a set time frame that they're allowed to do this event. So they had more people oh, than they had time. So it was poor planning on their part. And uh, they started the event at 7 a.m. in the morning. I never in my life uh, you heard of events starting that early. So we were going to have to check out early. And uh, that was going to leave my wife sitting outside the venue for three hours before the event. And I just told him, I said, guys, I said, I can't do that. You know, I I'll sacrifice things for myself. But, you know, when you start talking about me making sacrifice, uh, I'm, I'm choosing to sacrifice my family for this. I just can't do it. No. And um, so I ended up, I ended up, and they had a whole big fiasco with other things too. They had, guys stealing the medals and, and just, it, was, <laughs> it was ridiculous but uh you know as with everything with me i always look to build so uh out of that i realized all the problems that they had setting up the event and now i'm working right now to set up a sanctioned event in my area um Dude, so, that's uh, fantastic see that's opportunity shows up and that good on you man for having the intelligence and the and the fortitude to to grab an opportunity some people would just say oh well they were messed up and play the victim no that's an opportunity that's that's how they show up in life they show up as some kind of mistake some kind of mess hey i think i can do this yeah and and that and that's really a lot of times that's how my business strategy of setting things up has always been 
Uh, and I've done that with everything, uh, whether it be, you know, with competitions or I did the last real job I had was, was, you know, for, for was like a, like a security position where I was working for the man. Right. So I was doing security and our supervisor, this is, a, this is something, uh, as far as, uh, grabbing, seizing the opportunity. So I had a, um, my supervisor that was over the entire area, he had a stroke. So when he had a stroke, it threw everything in disarray. I'm sure I don't, I had only been working for the company for two weeks, <laughs> but I walked in there the morning where everybody's going, I don't know what to do. I walked into this place and I said, all right, um, I'm going to sign you this shift, you this shift. I'm going to work this shift. And uh, let me call. And so I just basically walked in there and took control. And That's the way to do it. Be bold, and, man. And, and I literally seized the supervisor position. Like they give it, the, 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 the head boss called over and he's like, he's like, Hey, uh, we're going to try and send somebody over. I said, it's already taken care of. And he's like, what? I said, yeah, I took care of it. And he's like, well, you just earned yourself a title, young man. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you got to do, it. man. You got to grab it. You can you, opportunities, man. They fly by. You got to reach out and seize them before they fly away. They're fleeting. Ain't that the truth? And so many people miss that. So many people are waiting for that golden moment, that perfect time uh, there'll be some kind of sign or, you know, the, ah, you now it's the time. No, it's going to happen just like that. You better move on it quick. Um, yeah, that's a wonderful thing. About Odin Sun Archery, man, how long you been doing that? You, you're one of the top five trick shots or archers in the, I mean, you got a standing there somewhere, don't you? <laughs> I, I like to think I'm pretty good at, at slinging an arrow. Uh, you know, <laughs> um, you know, I, <laughs> I, 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 I like to be a hum, humble man. I don't ever like to get myself a little too high, but uh, you know, yeah, I, I, I've, I've done a trick or two, uh, you know, split and playing cards and shooting aspirins and things like that, you know, oh, which with, with, with uh, bows that most people that do those tricks don't use, they usually use something a little more modern. Uh, they're mm -hmm. not using a, a self bow where they're shooting off their hand. Uh, but uh, yeah, I've been doing that for gosh, man, it's probably been, five six years again i'm crazy with time so it, it may be shorter it may be longer <laughs> but i actually started doing that while i was working that security job oh okay because yeah where we were at we were pretty much by ourselves uh for 12 hour shifts and i'm sitting there i'm not doing anything in a guard shack and i said eh, let me play around with this a little bit and before you know it opportunities <laughs> That is awesome. I mean, I, I'm, you, you still sell them. You still do pretty good. You, your website's odinsonarchery.com, and that it? Yeah, odinsonarchery.com on there. Um, yeah, I've got a lot of stuff. I've had my stuff reviewed by, uh, by Recall Magazine. I had an article in a Backwoods Survival Guide. Yes. Um, yeah, and uh, it, it's a lot of the Blade shows. I've had, like, some of the top, like, craftsmen, you know, Jason Knight, uh, who was on Forged and Fire. You know, I've had him looking at my bows. and, and I remember uh, that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been a process, you know, it's, it's funny, when it comes to like, businesses and, and these things, you know, I, I talk to a lot of people who are trying to set up businesses. And, uh, you know, I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm not, a, I didn't go to school for business, I am, I am literally flying by the seat of my pants. But one of the things that I that I tell them, it was just kind of, we were just talking about a minute ago, is you got to just do it. Don't wait for everything to be perfect. Don't wait for the perfect label. I mean, you look at my product back in the beginning to now, it's, it's apples and oranges. You know, I, in the beginning I was, I didn't even, I couldn't even afford like the minimal gear. And I was, I was heating bows up via a, uh, an, uh, like a, like the oven. I was using the, the, the eye of the stove sitting there, you know, just, just going back and forth trying to heat it up, you know, and now I've got a whole system set up for, for, uh, for doing that. You know, that's, that's, it's interesting you say that. that was the same thing when I started my tower company years ago. I had a, uh, I had a little red Toyota Corolla with a clogged catalytic converter. Thing wouldn't hardly go up a hill, but I had to pay the rent. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I found a company that would pay me fifty cents a foot to climb a tower and change the light bulbs. I got some insurance and built it from there. And everybody laughed at me, called it the fly-by-night operation, and you're not going to have it. And you know there was a lot of naysayers, a lot of people out there that don't want to see people succeed you know unless they've well they've got they've earned the right to go do that well i don't know that i always buy into that i think earning the right to go do that and be successful in business is giving yourself permission to grab that opportunity and that's that's something you don't see every day and i think a lot of people 
I think a lot of people miss that, you know, and they settle. I was talking to Chase McDougall last week about people that settle. He said, excuse me while I spit. He's a trip. <laughs> yeah, I like Chase, uh, you know, fellow fellow martial artist and a good all-around dude. He really is, you know, and he, I've known him for several years. He's He's been that way. He's kind of like you, man. He's, he's never deviated from who and what he is. And I think that's something that we should always respect, Chris Jocchio. He's never deviated from who and what he is. You know, a lot of these really good people have never, we've seen him grow. I Hopefully I've developed a little bit, but, but the, we shouldn't. I, I pointed out a while back that when we, we become heathens, when we become ostrich or pagans or whatever you want to call yourself, we become that hallmark of what it means to adopt an alternative lifestyle to everyone around us. Everybody's watching, everybody's looking. I think we have a large responsibility to do, be successful in everything we do. What's yeah. your, uh, you, you come from a, from a fairly Christian background, don't you? Yes, uh, I come from a, uh, a long lineage <laughs> of, of uh, Christians. Um, you know, my, 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 my family, original family crest was, uh, was the, the heads of, it's a sword with three heads on it uh, because that was so basically from uh, that area where they were at that the people were coming in there and trying to get them to, to change their religion. And uh, they wanted to push them out of there. So the family crest, those three heads are the three people they sent. And the sword is what they put them on. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so, yeah, I come from a long line, man. That's, um, you know, my grandfather, my great-grandfather was a Bible salesman here in Oklahoma. So, I mean, that, I got the same kind of setup. There was, I mean, I remember I was, I was told at my father's funeral that my, that my daddy, he wasn't very happy with how I was living at his funeral by those cousins. That's, that's how deep it is. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so you, you go to the SHOT Show. Are you at all interested in, in jumping off into making knives or anything like that? Uh, Getting yeah. into the foraging? Yeah, I've, I've, I've looked at it. Um, I, I, I've, I, I've messed around with, um, with, with, with the idea. There's, there's a long way to go in that. Right. And, um, you know, it's something that I've played around with. I, I'm always tinkering around with things. That's the other thing with, with my family. My dad was a builder, uh, also. Right. So, um, you know, I, I tend, I tend to tinker with things. I, I picked up a project last night I've been working on for like, it was like a three-year-old project that I got frustrated with and threw it in the back of the closet. And uh, I pulled it out last night and started tinkering with it. And I now have a working prototype of, uh, I guess I haven't told anybody yet, but I, I guess I'll just spill the beans here real quick. Do it's it, not man. Gonna, <laughs> it's not going to be for, it's going to, this is, this is a Brian Wilton exclusive, but uh, I'm working on an arrow gun, um, an actual like compressed air arrow gun. So, um, man, so, that's outstanding. Yeah, so you know, it's 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 something I've got kind of a working prototype, but I have to kind of play around with it a little bit. Um, real quick, I wanted I wanted to, uh, as you were saying that, I kind of flashed back a little bit. You were talking about you know about your uh, the thing with the Christian where they were saying you know they weren't really uh, pleased with the way you were living. You know, I went through that a lot because my my, my granddaddy was a uh, he was a Southern Baptist preacher. My uncle's a preacher. My daddy was a preacher. You know, we went through all that. And uh, I even was a, uh, I actually do have a, a license as a, uh, as a Christian minister. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, obviously I've, uh, I've walked a different path than that now, but um, you know, I, I was told the same thing and, you know, people don't think about the type of, of pressure that it puts on followers of Austria a lot of times, especially with the stuff that's going on in, in the, in the media now as well. Uh, classic example, when I was at the, when I, I, when I went to, um, I didn't, I didn't compete in the event, but I arrived after the event and I was talking to some of the people that were at the sumo competition and there was a lady that walked to me and she, you know, I'm, I'm shaking everybody's hand cause that's what I do. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, you know, and this lady walked up and I went to shake her hand and she kind of pulled her hand back and I, I looked at her and she kind of backs up and she goes, Odinson, because I was wearing an Odinson archery shirt and I had my hammer on, you know, and she's like, Odinson. And I was like, yeah. And she's like, she's like, uh, are you one of the good ones or one of the bad ones? And I'm like, oh, how do you tell the difference? What does that mean? Like, so let me get this straight. You just, you just, per you just basically 
come up with an opinion about me as an individual, even though I'm being polite and to every single person I meet, you just come up with an opinion of me as an individual uh, based on what my religion. There's a lot of there's a lot of uh, places that uh, if you did that you would get fired, right? You would you would like if I if I if I had a guy from you know who was who was Islamic. And he went and shake my hand. I pulled his hand back. I'm like, are you one of the good ones or one of the bad ones? You know, <laughs> I mean, come wow. on, man. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? And, but, but that's the sort of thing that a lot of people don't think about. You know, they don't, they don't understand, you know, that they, they, they want to lump everybody into, into a group. I'm, I've always been the type of person that I, I judge people on their works. I judge people on their, um, you know, the, their personality, the types of things they do. And, uh, you know, let the chips fall where they may on that. You know, with my family, I, I run into the same problem. A lot of them, they're, they're Christian. A lot of them, they're, they're by the book Baptist. I mean, you know, oh, when the church yeah. is open, when the church is open, you're in there. They're, they're that, that is the kind of people. And, you know, I run into the same thing. But people will also tell you out of, out of my family, I'm the, I am also the guy. I may be the heathen, but I'm also the guy that's probably the most trustworthy and the guy that uh, will always do what he says he's going to do. So that's that example that you were talking about. Uh, the same thing with shaking hands and I'm shaking hands with everybody. I'm, interested, I'm, I'm polite to every single person I meet and that those little things set an example. A lot of dudes want to throw on a hammer and they want to walk around and puff their chest out and, and show how big and bad they are and everything. I'm like, man, I, I'm, I'm voted the guy most likely probably to save a life or open a door for somebody, you know, that, right. that's, and that's the example that people should set. It's not all, you know, listening to, to war Druna and, and throwing axes. And shit, you know? <laughs> it's, 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 it's about an example. You, there's a lot of negative stereotypes out there. And instead of bitching about them, which most people do, let's all start working to change them. That's, that's where the power lies. I agree with you hundred percent on that. You know, when I started this job um, as a sprinkler pipe fitter, company that I worked for, the owner of the company was raised Amish, and now he's Southern Baptist, and it's a very Christian company. So I didn't go in there leading with the chin, and I see that as a failure of most people that come into Austria, they start leading with the chin. Well, I've figured something out. You don't. I'm a little bit more important than you are, and they, they got all this justification and research to justify their radical deviation from, uh, from a societal norm. Um, when I went to work for this company, that's not something I'm going to do. I'm not going to go in there leading with the chin. I didn't say a word about it. I went in there and worked as hard as I possibly could. Yes, sir. No, sir. Broke my back, set an example and worked until the day was done. Now I'm a foreman. I started in February, small victories, small things, but somebody did come along and started talking about what they knew with regards to even me. And then they Googled my name. And then um, one of them came up and said, hey, uh, they, they took a look at who you were. And all I could think of was, well, do I need to go find a new job? I mean, literally, I was like, I was ready for them to fire me. Uh, because that's when people were getting docs. Because people get these jobs and then they lead with the chin about something they think they know or they think they understand. And they put themselves at risk. I mean, they literally lay their own necks on the chopping block and it's so much simpler to go out there and be that example of a decent human being of a decent man standing upright walking tall making a good living putting food on the table and being a demonstration of what all these values are supposed to be about i'm glad you said that man i mean because that's very crucial it's so easy to to get caught up in the flash and pizzazz of of wanting to be special because everybody wants to feel unique Everybody wants to feel special. Everybody wants to feel loved, you know? And a lot of times they won't go out like you have to build Odinson Archery or take control of a situation or like I have to go out and write a book or something along those lines. They'll just talk on the internet. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's not where it's at. You're absolutely right. Yeah, the, the, there, there's a big problem right now of way too much time on the internet. and. You know, uh, most people use the internet as as a toilet. They they, they use it just to just to flush That's whatever. That's a good deal, man. That's exactly right. <laughs> they they use it to flush whatever garbage the, what they want. They want to just you know here's this meme. Here's this uh, 
here's this and here's that. And it's like, you know, you guys don't understand that there's power in the internet if you use it correctly. But most people just use it as a toilet to flush whatever shit they can come up with uh, out. And um, that's a huge mistake. So how many bows are you currently making? you got four or five different models, don't you? Oh, man, I've got, wow, let's see. I've got uh, I've got a lot of different, I've got some models that are similar that, that, have, uh, that have different uh, designs to them. I would probably say overall, I'm probably up to way too many models, probably more like 10 models. Um, I recently have a, have, a, I have a fiberglass model that's out now. Right. And I, I debuted at the Blade Show that actually has fiberglass limbs with uh, wooden seas, which those are the ends, and uh, has a wooden riser, which is the middle, uh, for people that aren't uh, privy to archery. Um, so so it's, 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 made, a, it's a composite laminate kind of bow? Yes, yeah. Using the, oh, same, wow. using the same techniques that they would use uh, with, uh, say, like when the Mongolians were making bows, using the same techniques, the same, uh, you know, the because most Mongolian bows, people people don't realize they were pretty much just glued together, uh, glued yeah. glued wrapped, and yes. um, that was actually where a lot of the power came from. So I actually have have done the same thing just with modern materials. Um, that, that, that's have always you, been my motto, you know. Uh, you know, traditional archery with non traditional materials. It has been. I, you're right. I I was going to ask, have you ever considered using horn in a bow like that? Because I know that. It, I know that they used wood. There was a, I don't know which culture it was. I don't know if it was Mongolians or Chinese or something, but some people had layers of horn in that riser to give it, to make it stiffen. Um, yeah. Yeah. Both. You'd see it both Chinese and the Mongol. Most of those Asiatic areas used a lot of horn. That's amazing. Who would have ever thought that a horn would bend? You know, I know it, it's an amazing <laughs> process to see too. Um, I'm working on my, my wife tells me she doesn't want me to do it, uh, but I'm working on, uh, actually making some some wood and going completely with with wood and like bamboo and stuff yes. she doesn't want me to do it because she knows i'm probably gonna i get frustrated and so that's part of my creative process i get angry i throw things and, and <laughs> before you know it something beautiful appears <laughs> it's true it's true man um it is important to be creative i think for men i, I think I, I think it is and people don't everyone because you know oh well he's a feminist no i think I think men need that outlet too. We got to create, we garden, we build things, we hunt. These, these expressions of skill that are innate to our nature are so crucial to us to becoming something and this, and these bows. Now, are they, are, are they legal for hunting? Do they have the full uh, 40 pound or 50 pound pull weight you can hunt with? Yeah, I, I, I've made them all the way up. The heaviest bow I ever made was I made a war bow that was a hundred pound draw weight. Um, Holy cow. Ridiculous. I mean, and I tell everybody, I'm like, look, this is, this is not, this is something that, I'm selling that, you know, you get it because you want it, but I'm just going to tell you, it's not going to be fun to shoot. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> Thank you, it's, 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 I mean, I, I don't like super heavy bows, but yeah, I make them, I make them, you know, 60 pounds, 50 pounds, 45 pounds, 35 pounds. Uh, See, a 60 pound bow is good for hunting. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, you know, too, for most hunting, for most hunting, you know, most people try and up their bow. They try and have stronger bow. When in reality, they should be focusing on their arrow a lot more. Uh, really? A lot of, yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people, they want that big, heavy bow, and they're like, oh, this will do it. And I'm like, look, man, if you have a good, a good arrow with a good amount of weight to the arrow and a sharp broadhead, 45-pound bow will kill most things you're going to run into in North America. If you start upping it to things larger, you start going to – uh, you know, elk and, and bear and everything. Yeah. You're going to have to up the poundage a little bit because you got a lot more meat to, to shoot through. Right. Uh, hog, hogs can be a little, a little more of an issue because they got that thick, you know, shield on the side that you got to burst through. But uh, most of the time people have to up their arrow. A lot of people use too light of an arrow. Um, I, I like a heavy arrow because I, I, I view it like this. People say, well, the light arrow is going so fast. And I say, well, okay. I can take a, uh, let's take like a motorcycle, like a crotch rocket, you know, and I can get that thing going super fast and I ran, and you get hit, you're in your car and you get hit by it. Right. That's mm -hmm. going to mess your car up. You know, it's going to be in pretty bad shape, right? It's going, you know, 60, 70 miles an hour, but now let's, let's take it and move it to a semi truck now who's only going 15 or 20 miles an hour and he hits your car. 
what's the damage is going to be much worse because of the weight for arrows a lot of people view arrows in the same capacity as they do bullets but they're different arrows are dependent upon the mass to allow it to drive through that target. once it hits that mass keeps carrying it through the target and so that, that's what they want people miss that flex when the arrow actually leaves the bow i mean we've all seen the slow motion where it flexes is that actually generating momentum to help it move forward yeah I mean, that's it, okay i yeah, got you now that, yeah and that that's that's why um a lot of people you know uh they asked me about like arrow spine and cause the spine basically is how rigid it is. Right. Right. And, um, you know, a lot of times, you know, I tell people about different hacks and stuff they can do because some people say, well, you know, these arrows are a little too heavy or, or they're a little too rigid for my bow. And I say, you know, add more weight to the front of it, you know, add more weight to the front of your arrow. Cause if you add more weight to the arrow, you have to think when the, when the, when you shoot the bow, all the pressure is coming from the rear. Right. So when it meets the weight in the front, that will give you your flex. So it allows you to cheat that rigidity. So I'll be that. dang. And see, <laughs> that's the kind of stuff that, that's interesting. Have you ever considered putting all of this in a manual? Have you ever considered publishing some of this stuff yourself? I have actually. Um, I, that's some well, thoughts. what's the hold up, man? I, Come I on. know. <laughs> I know. Because, you know, you, you're talking about creativity earlier. And uh, that's one of the things I, I had a long discussion uh with uh, some people the other day, I was talking about creativity. I said, you know, one of the things for me, because the way I've got my, my system set up, you know, I, I work right here at home. I have my shop set up right here at my home. And I said, but you know, that's a blessing and a curse because I'm <laughs> always at work. I'm always at work. <laughs> and a lot of times the only thing I see are, are these four walls and, you know, I got my dog with me and then that's, that's pretty much all I see. So a lot of times I've been making bows so long. A lot of times I, it's, uh, it, you can get very stagnant. I don't have to think about it anymore. I just do it. And uh, that creativity gets stifled. And, right. you know, it, it's, it's, it's why I've, I've had, I've had the urges to, to come back and do, that's one of the things I'm glad you were, you were doing, you asked me to do this interview because, you know, I'm like, man, I, I, I want to just get, I want to get on and talk. Like I want to get online and, and do, do podcast again and everything, you know, just, because you know that was one of the great things about pro wrestling pro wrestling allowed me to be you can like express yourself yeah, yeah you know and I, I could go out there i could i could amp up my personality times 10 and uh, you know <laughs> go out there and, and, and do my thing <laughs> that's funny it's awesome is what it is you know that it is it is a lot of fun um uh, to get on here and talk i mean uh, we find i think both of us are kind of in the same unique position we know a lot of interesting people we've come across people with the with the vivid imaginations that have some kind of inspiration that are creative that that have drawn attention that have set a mark in some way uh, yeah it's a lot of fun alan i mean it really is to get on here and and have a conversation with somebody and uh, it doesn't really matter what's going on or what they say but to get on here and just to talk about it man just to share it i mean i think that's I think that that communication is, is, I think we miss a lot of that. I think we get tied up in issues and, and, and small minded ideas. Um, I got to tell you, I was talking with Sydney and uh, Sydney Horton and she, uh, we did our little interview. She's just amazing. You know, she's, she's completely different from anything about me. Um, but she's decided she's going to focus on her expression of spirituality because of that conversation. And, and um, she's going to enjoy a ton of success with it. She's 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 making that shift because of a conversation, because of being able to talk with someone that, you know, we're not sitting here trying to one up each other with, I know this or I know that. It's a, that's the kind of thing we need more of in this. And I think that would go a long way in diffusing the, the internet mentality, the flush the toilet kind of thought process, as you so eloquently put it. Yeah, it, it and and that's the thing too is. Like most people that are talking these days, they're talking about, you know, the the, the political issues. You know, there's yeah. it's, it's it's the it's right easy sell. It, it it's it's an extremely easy sell. And and I myself, I myself, if, you know, when I was running my podcast, I myself would do the same thing at times. You know, because it is an easy sell. You know, when you're trying to come up with content, you're trying to come up with this, and you you know you want you, you know you get outraged. It's very easy to do so. Oh hell uh, yeah. But, you know, yeah, but you know, I, I've I've been thinking recently. When, you know, when I've mulled the idea over of of, of coming back and 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 uh, talking again with with shows and everything, you know, I, I 
I've thought about, you know, when I really think about it, it's not about, you know, demonizing the left. It's not about, you know, praising the right, demonizing the right, whatever, whatever your, your thing is. The main problem that we're suffering from right now is not based in left wing or right wing politics. It's based in society. Society is crumbling around us and people aren't, uh, they're not paying attention. They're not paying attention to the little things. It's little things, you know, the, the who cares mentality. Uh, I think there's a fine line between getting caught up in, you know, little political ramblings and complete apathy. You know, I used to always use the, use the idea of building your walls too high. It's like, well, if it's not happening in my group or in my tribe, I don't care. Well, there's a problem with that because if you build your walls so high, well, you don't see the enemy when he's coming. And by the time you realize that the enemy's arrived, it's like, oh, shit, he's at the gates. And now yeah. all of these other people that were around you, you never had – um, you, you know, you didn't pay them any attention and you were just like, oh, you know, don't worry about those guys. And they've been slowly wiped out. Then it's just you. So I think a lot of times, uh, you know, our society is the same way. We, we say, you know, well, you know, I ain't worried about those people. They're hopeless or whatever. And then I get that. I understand that. But I think people need to start really breaking down the little things in our society that are falling apart. Um, things like, um, and, and you know, I, I'm a, I'm a martial artist. I'm you know I'm I'm I, I've done all manners of different kind of violence. I've fought and MMA, I've boxed, all these things, and um, you know we see we see these epidemics of of violence popping up, and we're wondering, you know, why in the world is this happening? You know, it, it's happening because people are we've almost become so desensitized to. To, to the violence around us. Uh, we, we've become desensitized to uh, the death process, these sorts of things. Everything is so removed. So now people are starting to, um, you know, they're starting to act out. Uh, there's a lot of mental illness. That mental illness is based off of society. So, so things, things are falling apart around us. And, um, you know, we live in an outrage culture now. And uh, we live in a... Um, a culture where everything is spotlighted via the internet. So everybody wants to be famous. Everybody wants to feel something. A lot of people I think are dead inside anymore. And I think that's the reason they're so willing to become emotional because they want to just feel something. You know, I'm writing about that very thing right now. So when you started talking about it, it really caught my attention to hear another perspective on it. There is and I'm specifically I'm talking about the suicides um, and death in general. We don't have a healthy relationship with this creative process of the soul and death because that's a creative process. It's a radical transformation. We can't begin to understand. And I think so many people that are dealing with these things as we move through life, everybody talks about the adolescent and the stage of transition becoming a man, right? Well, once you become a man, there's other things to change through and parts of you need to die so that you can continue to move forward. And we're not giving people a healthy opportunity to look at what part of that person is no longer necessary so that you can go and become something better. And there's a frustration created in that lack of clarity. When you brush up against the edges of your thought process, it's chaos there, that wall that we build around our community, right? Um, we do the same thing in our thought process. We build a, a creative barrier. And when we brush up against that without any clear image of what we want to become, which I think we are truly lacking, we don't have a clear image of what we want to become. It creates a lot of confusion. And that confusion is given off in the streets. And all of that energy goes to feed something. And all of that energy makes somebody else feel self-righteous. And then whatever hint of an idea we might have wanted to become gets lost. So when I hear somebody else thinking along those same lines, and I know that was a little bit different than what you said, but, but I think it all boils down to is we don't have a clear image of what we want to become. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times if you don't know who you want to become, trust me, there are plenty of people out there who will try to decide for you. You damn right there is. A I'm lot one of, of them. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, there are plenty of people out there. And, you know, and that's one of the dangers that people run into. There's a, there's a lot of good men and women out there. There's also a lot of Pied Pipers that are leading the rats right off the edge of the cliff, you know, and um, it, it's, it's very easy to fall into that. I, I've never been, I've always been kind of a, kind of a loner type of personality. Uh, right. always since I, since I was a kid, you know, I still have my friends. I have the people that I keep in touch with and everything, but um, you know, I've always been kind of, I don't want to say I'm the, I'm the, I'm, I've been kind of anti-tribe, but uh, you know, I've been a, um, you know, I've always found a lot of personal strength in myself. And I think right. being a loner, I understand as a, um, as an individual, you know, uh, compared to the tribe, the tribe is much stronger than the individual. And, but I also understand that if I'm going to choose to be the individual, I have to be strong um, to make up for the lackings of not having a tribe. And uh, I think a lot of people right now um, don't take that sort of mentality and it leads to a lot of dysfunction. It does lead to a lot of dysfunction. You know, that, that whole story of Odin going on his wandering and sacrificing himself on the tree to himself. That's an aspect of that. When he when he lost his throne and in, in the in the Aesir Vanir War and he goes to wander and he makes that sacrifice to himself of himself, he he gets rid of some aspect of himself so that when he goes back, he's a much better person, a much stronger person, and much more worthy to associate with those powerful individuals who have accepted challenges of their own. I see a lot of people not willing to make that sacrifice to become something better. And like you, I, I don't really have a kindred around here. I know a lot of people, but I also see a lot of people not willing to wander and make those sacrifices necessary. And I'm hesitant to bring them close to my sons and my daughters and my grandchildren. You know what I mean? That's, that's my, uh, and I could be wrong. I mean, I could be way off base. I may be the first one to fall. So there you go. You know, I mean, that's, that's how it is, but, but there's a, um, there's a real reluctance for people to grow. I don't think they see it. I, I don't think they understand why they should do it. And it's so easy to get so righteously indignant about Greta and uh, her precious or whatever else might be going on. And I think people confuse that kind of righteous indignation for spiritual experience. And they've never had to leave the comfort of their desk and their computer or their phone. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, and it's, and it's, it's a common thing, man. It's, 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 it's very, very common. It's, it's scary to, to get out there sometimes. And I think a lot of people, a lot of people aren't willing, you know, wander if you, if you know, your country boy, you know, you know, you know what it's like to, I'm sure you've headed off into the woods by yourself yeah. at times and can you yes. know, camping trips and everything. It's scary. Life's the exact same way, man. It's scary to get out there and wander and, and if it was up to me, man, I, 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 I complain about not being around, you know, going out and, and seeing people in the four walls. But if it's up to me, man, I'd, I'd stay in my cave, you know, here with my dogs and everything. And, you know, but, <laughs> right. but it, it's, it's scary to put yourself out there. It's scary to get out there and, and, and uh, you know, try and navigate this world. You know, when I was starting my business up, most people, and I talk to them, you know, why aren't you starting your business? Why, why, you've got this idea. Why isn't it going? Why isn't it going? It all comes right back back to fear again it's the fear of putting yourself out there it's scary and a lot of people a lot of people try and <laughs> try and say you know that uh, they're too tough to be scared i'm not scared of anything no man no I, I i'm scared every single time i fought guess what i was scared you know yep. what but I, I still did it and that's where the power comes from uh whether it's whether it's business endeavors whether it's anything whether it's making a trick shot in archery and failing in front of all these people that are watching you you know it happens, you know, and we have to understand that we are, we're not infallible or anything. We're, we're going to fall. We're going to, we're going to always run into troubles along the way, potholes, but we always have to find a way past them. All they do is it's a redirection. You know, when an arrow, if an arrow doesn't hit the target, a lot of times if I'm shooting at a target, if the arrow doesn't hit the target dead on and it misses, the arrow doesn't stop. The arrow just deflects. It flies off in a different direction and keeps going. And I can always find my way back to that bullseye. You know, that's the truth too. I mean, it, people, it, it takes courage to get out there. When I, when I, you know, these books that I've written, I mean, I've, I've put myself out there. I've put it all on paper, 
you know, I can't take it back now. I mean, it's out there. People have read it and people have believed it and people have made fun of me for it. They've called it chicken soup for the heathen soul and all kinds of nonsense. And, uh, and for a long time, it took me a minute to, uh, to figure out how to deal with that. It took me a long time to figure out um, that it doesn't matter what they fucking say, you know. And, it, and, and now I have found that in that process of learning that, it has allowed me to be more expressive, more creative. And, you know, can you – and so when I look at the women that try to do these things, holy cow. We're grown men dealing with a savage culture, you know, and there's a lot of strength in what we do every day and getting up, hitting the floor and going and trying to succeed. Imagine being a child in that environment. You know, I, I've, I've said it before, if we were to plug a child in all of that nonsense that, that we're putting out there on social media, they'd go insane. Imagine the pain and confusion they would have. And we're just now figuring out how to deal with it. I think the cultivation of that image has got to be one of our highest priorities. Yeah. And speaking of that, I mean, what kind of legacy are you planning on leaving? What kind of image are you going to cultivate? Because that's, that's the thing here that people are looking at you saying, all right, this is a successful businessman. He's exerted himself physically. He's gone out there and tried. What kind of image are you going to leave? Well, you know, the, the image and the legacy I'm looking to leave is uh is very much still a work in progress uh it's it's not it's uh you know a lot a lot of people have a very clear picture of of where it goes um for me <laughs> i don't i don't have a clear picture of where it ends up but the main thing that i'm focused on is constantly moving forward um too many people steps backwards you know they go backwards and, and for me it's always about i want people I want people to understand, uh, you know, that I was an individual who, who never quit. I wanted them to know that I was a guy that kept pushing forward because people see the business, you know, successful businessmen. Guess what? The foundation of that is a lot of failed businesses. A lot right. of them. I mean, it is, that, that's, that's what this is built on is failures. And, and that's okay because if you're, if you're not failing, if you win at everything, what do you ever learn? Right. Um, Ain't that the truth? And, and you know, w with me, my legacy is always about. I always want to want people to say, you know, that guy, he was always pushing forward. He was always, uh, you know, being a being someone who was creating. I wanted to be a creator. There's a lot of people who are takers. There's a lot of people who even even people that come across. A lot of people are very quick to toss on that good guy badge. You know. Look at me. I'm a good guy. I'm trying to help you. Look, here's my badge. It's right here. You know, look at it. And um, few people don't realize that a lot of these, a lot of these guys are just trying to be takers. Um, and, and they they can even seem to have the best of intentions, but a lot of times they're takers. I don't ever want somebody to say that about me. Uh, you know, the, the last individual I worked for, which happened to be family, uh, you know, I, I had a problem with them, and uh, th basically they were. They were an individual whose sole purpose was money. Their sole purpose was greed. You know, they wanted to have, 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 have. And I used to always see them. They would be sitting at their desk and they would have their stacks of money. And they would sit there and just set it out on the desk like it was like they're precious, I guess you could say, right? And they got it all, <laughs> they got it all, they got it all, all set out. I'm just looking and I'm like, and I'm, but as I'm looking at that, I'm looking at their face and I go, they look miserable. They're, they're, they just have this hard, they've got all this money and they look miserable. I don't want to be that guy. Uh, I don't want to, I don't want to be the guy that has the legacy of them saying, you know what, that guy right there, he'll sell you out so fast to make a buck. I, I don't want to be that guy because the, the reality is, is true immortality. The true immortality that most of us see, true immortality is in the stories that are told of you as you're gone. I want people to say, you know what, man, Alan Odinson, I used to get on there and I used to listen to him speak and, and man, he had a lot of fire and he had a lot of passion in his voice. And I love that. And I still get people to come up to me that talk about pro wrestling and I ain't done that in, you know, 10 years, you know, I, I, that, but that's the thing. I want people, I want people to realize that, that all these things are possible. You don't, you don't have to go to college. You don't have to, 
Uh, you don't have to be a great public speaker. I was a horrible public speaker growing up, terrible. And now I love it. I get, give me the mic, and I'll get I'll get in front of a crowd and, and talk shit for an hour. You know, I mean that's 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 what I do. Um, you know, but one of the things I used to always say about my dad, you know, me and my dad were a lot alike, but as much as we were alike, we were also different. My dad's legacy. Whenever anybody mentions him, they always say he was a humble man. He was a humble man, and I get that, and I think that's great to an extent. But my dad was ten times the builder that I that I am. But nobody knows his name, right? And that is something that's always stuck with me. Uh, I don't ever want to be that guy who doesn't who they don't know who he is. You know, when it's it's a great feeling for me to to go to places like Blade Show and people go, "Oh, you're Alan Oates and you're the bow guy." Yes, right. that is me. You know, it's like the old uh, thing from Pirates of the Caribbean where they tell they tell um johnny depp they say they say you're the worst pirate i've ever heard of and he says i have heard of me haven't you it's true you know? it's the truth man <laughs> but that that's really the key that's really the key though for legacy for me I, I i want i want to exemplify what it means to be constantly in a state of evolution and constantly in a state of growth i never want to be that guy who was stagnant because that was me at one time and i look back at that person now in disgust yeah, I know that feeling. I understand exactly what you mean. I, uh, I, I like you need to write a book because one Scarlett's only eight. One of her grandchildren will carry my books from Mars or some shit like that. So I, <laughs> yeah. I feel pretty good about things, man. I feel like I got them on track with that. Um, you know, if you want help with that, I'll show you exactly how to do it. Man. It's a piece of cake. But uh, we've been out of the about an hour. We're gonna go ahead and wrap this up because I'm sitting outside and it's fixed to start raining on me. Uh oh. <laughs> but man, I really appreciate your time, Mal. It's always a good conversation. And I think these are the kind of conversations I don't think people realize these are the kind of conversations we have when we go to these get togethers, when we go to these meetups. We're talking about good things, about healthy things, about being men, about being women. I and uh, I think that's one of the most wonderful parts about living this Austrian life for me anyway. And I'm sure it is for a lot of people. I'm only going to talk about myself right now. Thank you for joining me, man. And what was your what was your uh, what was your website again? Website is odinsonarchery.com. You can find me uh, on there. You can also find me on uh, on Facebook, Odinson Archery there, and uh, you Alan Odinson on Instagram. I post a lot of stuff there too. So, uh, yeah, those bows are worth it. I need to buy one. I need yeah, to buy one lot, for Scarlet too. They're a lot of fun, man. You, you'll you'll learn a lot about yourself. Archery teaches you a lot about yourself. <laughs> um, because you know it's it's it, it exposes every flaw that you have so yeah it'll also expose your forearm if you ain't paying attention that's right <laughs> hey man it's good to talk to you Allie. you take care and i'll see you soon man thank you much man